The central bank can artificially expand credit still further in order to bolster the higher order stage's position in this tug of war, but it merely postpones the inevitable. If the public's freely expressed pattern of saving and consumption will not support the diversion of resources to the higher order stages, but in fact pulls those resources back to those firms dealing directly in finished consumer goods, then the central bank is in a war against reality. It will eventually have to decide whether, in order to validate all the higher order expansion, it is prepared to expand credit at a galloping rate and risk destroying the currency altogether, or whether instead it, instead it must slow or abandon its expansion and let the economy adjust itself to real conditions. Now, it's important to notice that the problem is not a deficiency of consumption spending, as the popular view would have it. If anything, the trouble comes from too much consumption spending, and as a result, too little channeling of funds to other kinds of spending, namely, the expansion of higher order stages of production that cannot be profitably completed because the necessary resources are being pulled away precisely by the relatively and unexpectedly stronger demand for consumer goods. Stimulating consumption spending can only make things worse by intensifying the strain on the already collapsing profitability of investment in higher order stages. Note also that the precipitating factor of the business cycle is not some phenomenon inherent in the free market. It is intervention into the market that brings about the cycle of unsustainable boom and inevitable bust. Roger Garrison, a well-known uh, US business cycle theorist, says, saving gets us genuine growth, credit expansion gets us boom and bust. This phenomenon has preceded all of the major busts booms and busts in American history, including the 2007 bust and the contraction in 1920 to 21. The years preceding 1920 were characterized by a massive increase in the supply of money via the banking system, with reserve requirements having been halved by the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, and then with considerable credit expansion by the banks themselves. Total bank deposits more than doubled between January 1914, when the Fed opened its doors, and January 1920. Such artificial credit creation sets the boom-bust cycle in motion. The Fed also kept its discount rate, the rate at which it lends directly to banks, low throughout the First World War and for a brief period thereafter. The Fed began to tighten its stance in late 1919. Once credit began to tighten, market actors suddenly began to realize that the structure of production had to be rearranged and that lines of production dependent on easy credit had been erroneously begun and needed to be liquidated. We are now in a position to evaluate such perennially fashionable proposals as fiscal stimulus nearly always meant in the form of increases in government spending and its various cousins. Think about the condition of the economy following an artificial boom. It is saddled with imbalances. Too many resources have been employed in higher order or interest rate sensitive stages of production and too few in lower order stages. These imbalances must be corrected by entrepreneurs who, enticed by higher rates of profit in the lower order stages, bid resources away from stages that have expanded too much and allocate them toward lower order stages where they are more in demand. The absolute freedom of prices and wages to fluctuate is essential to the accomplishment of this task since wages and prices are themselves indispensable ingredients of entrepreneurial appraisal. In light of this dis description of the post-boom economy, we can see how unhelpful even irrelevant, our efforts at fiscal stimulus. The government's mere act of spending money on arbitrarily chosen projects does nothing to rectify the imbalances that led to the crisis. 
It is not a decline in spending per se that has caused the problem. It is a mismatch between the kind of production the capital structure has been misled into undertaking on the one hand and the pattern of consumer demand which cannot sustain the structure of production as it is on the other. It is not unfair to refer to the recipients of fiscal stimulus as arbitrary projects. Since government lacks a profit and loss mechanism and can acquire additional resources through outright expropriation of the public, it has no way of knowing whether it is actually satisfying consumer demand, if it is concerned about this at all, or whether its use of resources is grotesquely wasteful. Popular rhetoric notwithstanding, government cannot be run like a business. Monetary stimulus is no help either. And incidentally, we could also talk about the so-called idle resources problem, but that does not validate fiscal stimulus either. Monetary stimulus only intensifies the problem. In human action, Mises compared an economy under the influence of artificial credit expansion to a master builder commissioned to construct a house that unbeknownst to him, he lacks sufficient bricks to complete. The sooner he discovers his error, the better. The longer he persists in this unsustainable project, the more resources and labor time he will irretrievably squander. Monetary stimulus merely encourages entrepreneurs to continue along their unsustainable production trajectories. My own personal contribution to Austrian business cycle theory is to introduce into Mises' allegory of the master builder the idea of getting the master builder drunk because we feel sorry for him that inevitably he's going to discover that the house he's building cannot be completed so we hate to see this be realized by him so instead we just intoxicate him so that he just continues on building without thinking about tomorrow but that doesn't make the house buildable now the house still can't be built but now he'll persist in building it all the longer and in fact, in the United States, we just experienced exactly this. In 2001, Alan Greenspan did the equivalent of getting the master builder drunk. Instead of allowing the economy to reconfigure itself, instead of allowing the bus to take its course, he liquored up the master builder. So that all this time, we have been continuing along unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. So that the bust is much worse than it would have been if we had stopped in 2001. Instead, in 2001, we saw for the first time on record in the U.S., housing starts increasing during a recession. Housing prices going up 8.8%. So when the free market was trying to give us a red light, all the lights we got were green, thanks to the Federal Reserve. Now, if the Austrian view is correct, and I believe the theoretical and empirical evidence strongly indicates that it is, then the best approach to recovery would be close to the opposite of these interventionist strategies. The government budget should be cut, not increased thereby releasing resources that private actors can use to realign the capital structure. The money supply should not be increased. Bailouts merely freeze entrepreneurial error in place. Instead of allowing the redistribution of resources into the hands of parties better able to provide for consumer demands in light of entrepreneurs' new understanding of real conditions. Emergency lending to troubled firms perpetuates the misallocation of resources and extends favoritism to firms engaged in unsustainable activities at the expense of sound firms prepared to put those resources to more appropriate use. This recipe of government austerity is precisely what Harding called for in his 1921 inaugural address, from which I quote, 
We must face the grim necessity with full knowledge that the task is to be solved, and we must proceed with a full realization that no statute enacted by man can repeal the inexorable laws of nature. Our most dangerous tendency is to expect too much of government and at the same time do for it too little. All right, he wasn't perfect, Warren Arding. We contemplate the immediate task of putting our public household in order. We need a rigid and yet sane economy combined with fiscal justice and it must be attended by individual prudence and thrift which are so essential to this trying hour and reassuring for the future. The economic mechanism, he continued, is intricate and its parts interdependent and has suffered the shocks and jars incident to abnormal demands, credit inflations, and price upheavals. The normal balances have been impaired. The channels of distribution have been clogged. The relations of labor and management have been strained. We must seek the readjustment with care and courage. All the penalties will not be light nor evenly distributed. There is no way of making them so. There is no instant step from disorder to order. We must face a condition of grim reality, charge off our losses, and start afresh. It is the oldest lesson of civilization. I would like government to do all it can to mitigate. Then, in understanding, in mutuality of interest, in concern for the common good, our tasks will be solved. No altered system will work a miracle. Any wild experiment will only add to the confusion. Our best assurance lies in efficient administration of our proven system. Harding's inchoate understanding of what was happening to the economy and, and why grandiose interventionist plans would only delay recovery is an extreme rarity among 20th century presidents of the US. That he has been the subject of ceaseless ridicule at the hands of historians to the point that anyone speaking a word in his favor would be dismissed out of hand speaks volumes about our historians' capabilities outside their own discipline. The experience of 1920 to 21 enforces, reinforces the contention of genuine free market economists that government intervention is a hindrance to economic recovery. It is not in spite of the absence of fiscal and monetary stimulus that the economy recovered from the 1920 to 21 depression. It is because those things were avoided that recovery came. The next time we are solemnly warned to recall the lessons of history, lest our economy deteriorate still further, we ought to refer to this episode and observe how hastily our interrogators try to change the subject. Now, since I've just been informed I've got five minutes, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, move beyond the discussion of the current, since you've, apparently you've all read all this about the U.S., you, you already know what happened in the U.S., I, I want to I, I make a few uh, additional remarks uh, outside of those. Remarks of encouragement, because we all know the free market takes the blame for the boom and bust and the severity of the bust in particular. But not everyone is, is buying that anymore. That's sort of an American colloquialism. Not, not everyone is, is accepting this anymore. And just as an example, well, first of all, look at yourselves here. I, I, I'm sure you're not getting in the Brazilian press a lot of information about Austrian business cycle theory. That's my wild guess. <laughs> and yet here you are. You refuse to believe what the alleged experts are telling you. That's great. Well, in the United States, in 2008, when we had our presidential election, and we got to choose between one jerk and another, another jerk, uh, we, the, the, the very week that the Republican Party presidential nominee was being officially nominated, 
and was accepting the nomination. Uh, a uh, American congressman named Ron Paul held his own event at the same time, right down the street. About 10,000 people there cheering for him and for uh, other people and for, for freedom in general and against the false choice that we're given in the U.S. So I, I had the great honor of speaking at that event. And, you know, I prepared my remarks. And when you prepare your remarks, you, you know, you know which lines people will laugh at, which ones they might clap for. But I never anticipated that when I said, just as a, an aside, I said it's interesting that a lot of people are becoming more interested in the Austrian theory of the business cycle. I had to stop talking because 10,000 people were cheering, were on their feet, cheering uncontrollably for the Austrian theory of the business cycle. <laughs> I thought, this is the dorkiest group of 10,000 people <laughs> I have ever seen. It is astonishing. At the same time that this is going on, that there is an, a kind of an awakening, the media in the United States is pretending nothing has changed. They're still playing the old game. Not long ago, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke was interviewed on a popular U.S. television program called 60 Minutes. Very, very rare is it to have the opportunity to interview the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Now, did they ask him any critical questions? Did they say, why has everything that has come out of your mouth been the opposite of the truth? Why should we listen to you now? In fact, it seems as if we would be in good shape to do the opposite of whatever you say. Did they ask what a journalist in a free country would ask? No. They asked questions that reporters for Pravda would have asked. They asked questions like, what worries you? What keeps you awake at night? <laughs> I mean, creepy, creepy. I hope what keeps him awake at night is the possibility of the audit of the Federal Reserve. I hope that keeps him up uh, at night. But this still goes on. But again, all is not lost. Paul Krugman said in 2001, what we need is for the Fed to give us low interest rates to spur housing. That's what caused the problem. And then, years later, he says, I predicted there would be a problem in housing. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> you caused it. Of course you predicted. <laughs> now, I want to go two minutes over my time, if, if that, that's OK. But he's not going unchallenged. There's now a whole, there's a blog dedicated to skewering this guy every day. Krugman in Wonderland <laughs> blog by William Anderson. You should go there. It's wonderful. And all, all Krugman's columns are sitting there on the internet waiting to be picked apart by more and more people who are dying to do it. Normally, he would go unchallenged. We would have to read Krugman and suffer through it. But he's being eviscerated every day. It's glorious. A student told me that the first day of class in an introductory economics course, his professor came out and wrote on the board, John Maynard Keynes. And that was going to be the theme of the course. Ladies and gentlemen, I dream of a world in which a professor who intends to do this to his students trembles before he enters the classroom, knowing that the students are ready for him. I dream of a world in which the Fed chairman is not treated with superstitious reverence, that the heads of central banks around the world are asked difficult questions about why they've been wrong. For that matter, I dream of a world in which the globe is no longer saddled with Soviet commissars in charge of money and interest rates who claim they can abolish the business cycle. I dream of a world in which economists are not apologists for government, explaining why it's for our own good for the parasites to seize our resources. 
but who instead describe the beautiful harmonies that the unhampered market fosters among people. Now, Austrian economics is value-free. Like any science, it is descriptive rather than prescriptive. Strictly speaking, it has nothing whatsoever to do with libertarianism. But what we learn from it can influence our values. We can learn from it that the parasitic behavior of our so-called public servants, whom we are taught in school to revere, in fact impoverishes the productive sector and hampers, if not reverses, the, pro the process of wealth creation for all classes. We can learn that central banks are unnecessary, that money always begins as a commodity on the free market. We can learn that the whole apparatus under which we labor is the greatest scam ever perpetrated on mankind. And we can learn that human beings interacting peacefully and without coercion, without hangmen and torturers, can establish a society of peace, freedom, and prosperity, the likes of which the world has never seen. And the founding of Mises Brazil takes us one step closer to that bright future. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Tom. Acho que os aplausos já mostram a empolgação. E, infelizmente, eu fui informado de que vamos ter que cumprir o, o horário rigorosamente. Então, não vamos ter tempo para muitas perguntas. É... Primeira pergunta, recebemos algumas da, da, da plateia. Primeira pergunta. Como foi que Hoover acabou sendo, recebendo o rótulo de ser um presidente pro laissez faire Okay. Good question. Uh, I've wondered this myself, given that Herbert Hoover, and I, I know this is a very educated audience, but I don't want to assume people know all about American presidents, especially when you don't have to, you know. I, you know, it's better for you not to know. But uh, Hoover was the president at the time of the stock market crash, and Hoover was the most interventionist president with regard to the economy that had ever been seen in American history. And it's interesting that when Franklin Roosevelt ran against him in 1932, Roosevelt's vice presidential nominee accused Hoover of taking us down the path to socialism. He didn't say, oh, Hoover isn't doing anything. Why doesn't he intervene? No, everyone knew that that wasn't true. So how did he get this reputation? Uh, and such that for, for decades afterward, until some important revisionist work was done, including by Murray Rothbard, everyone took this for granted. My own suspicion is partly that uh, people wanted to contrast the glorious and admired Franklin Roosevelt with, with an ogre. And so they, they made Hoover out to seem worse than he was. But I think the more important reason is that Hoover himself, during the 1930s, postured as an opponent of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal program. And I think people took him at his word. They, they listened to his pretty speeches, they read his book, and they said, well, gosh, I guess this guy believes in the free market. Whereas, in fact, Franklin Roosevelt's own aide, uh, I think it was Rexford Tugwell, actually admitted, really, the programs of Roosevelt's New Deal are all extrapolated from what Hoover did. So if you look closely, you see the, the Hoover roots of these programs, but if all you're doing is listening to Hoover's words, it sounds like he's against this root and branch. It's just like the Republican Party in the U.S. today. You would never know that half of them at the state level favor a health system exactly like the one they are against now. But the media doesn't point this out. The media says, oh, the, the Republicans are for the free market. They, they all favor the free market, even though, you know, 10 seconds ago they said the opposite. But they read whatever the current speech is, 
the, the media just accepts this at face value. And I think this happened with Hoover. They accepted his protest that he was against FDR at face value, when in fact FDR was simply building on what Hoover had done. Maybe he didn't like the extent to which Hoover had gone, uh, to which Roosevelt had gone. But, uh, but, but nevertheless, the programs ultimately came from him himself. Okay. Próxima pergunta, lembrando que se alguém quiser fazer perguntas diretamente, temos as belas moças com os microfones aí ao lado. É, o Mises Institute tem um importante papel na pesquisa da história econômica. Como dotar historiadores para que tenham conhecimento da teoria econômica? Como foram os seus passos para adquirir o conhecimento na ciência econômica? Ok. okay. Well, first of all, we can shame them into knowing it by, uh, frankly, ridiculing the work of those who just, I mean, for, let me just, let me put it this way. There are some episodes in U.S. history that most historians know nothing about. In the 19th century, there was controversy in the U.S. about gold versus silver and paper money. Most historians don't know the first thing about what any of this was about. So when they write, they just write whatever the textbook from 10 years ago said. They just write that. They hope no student brings it up and they go on. And I, I'm, I'm not being facetious. This is, this is real. So we need to find these weak spots and just pounce, just mercilessly uh, on, on them. Uh, I mean, any time a historian tries to claim Herbert Hoover did nothing, he needs to be rhetorically now kicked in the teeth, rhetorically, so that maybe next time, now that we have the internet and the whole world can see that what this guy just said is ludicrously at odds with reality, maybe they'll be a little careful about saying it next time because they don't want 500 comments in the comments section saying, you jerk, don't you know about this program, that program, that program, that program, that program? So informed people bombarding these people with comments on the blogs will do one of two things. It'll either get us all banned from these blogs or it will make them more cautious in the future. Maybe they'll repeat a different fallacy next time and stay away from this one. But how did I learn stuff? I learned it from the Mises Institute. I mean, there's no getting around that. I basically favored the free market, but I didn't know anything about the Austrian school until I saw an ad in a magazine for the summer program of the Mises Institute, Mises University, one week long. Lou, I don't even remember what magazine this would have been. And I thought, well, hey, that sounds great. I, I'd love to do this. So they send you the readings. This is before the internet. You know, they had to put the articles in the mail and send them to you. And I read, they had required readings and recommended readings. I was such a geek that, uh, this is, see how good your English is, if you know the word geek. If not, you can figure out from context what it means. But that I read all the recommended re I was addicted to this. I said, this is true. I, I believe this stuff. It makes sense. I read all the recommended readings, too, because I lived right near my college. I lived, my house was right nearby. I could use the university library all summer and track down all these journal articles. And, and once I went to the Mises University for that week, I never looked back. I, 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 I knew that fundamentally that the Austrian school, this, this was the way to go, and I've never stopped reading in it. There's always more to learn. I, I, I mean, I love meeting people. I, there are some people on this earth who always want to be around people who are not as smart as they are. I mean the exact opposite. I want to be surrounded by people who are 50 times smarter than I am, because I have so much I still want to learn. And I always try, that's why I, I try to have lunch with Joe Salerno as much as I can. You know, we'll try and talk sports here and there, and then I'll s just slip in a question about velocity of money. You know, just, just, he, he doesn't, he hasn't realized this trick yet. Yeah, so, th this is, so little by little, I'm improving my knowledge. But it was because of the Mises Institute. So that's why what's going on here is so important. And maybe someday you guys will have a Mises University Brazil for, for a week. And you will be able to spread the knowledge even more. Hello. Very inspiring answer. É, tem pergunta da plateia? 
É, eu tenho uma dúvida em relação ao, a, ao, ao período de 19, ao, a década de 1920, que é o seguinte, é, o, o, o Rothbard, no, no livro dele, a, a America's Great Depression, ele diz que, de 1921 a 1929, você teve um, um aumento muito grande da base monetária. A minha pergunta é a seguinte, o quanto que a recuperação depois da, da depressão de 22 foi devido ao excesso, da, ao aumento da base monetária, o quanto que foi devido ao, ao, às políticas do, do presidente? Ok. Well, it looks to me, from having looked at the data, that the, the Fed doesn't move to, uh, to, to increase the monetary base until 1922. And at least according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, the depression of 20 and 21 is over by the end of the summer of 1921. Now, having said that, we still might wonder about the rest of the 1920s, and the, which I think this is why it's, it's, we have to be careful just to say, isn't it wonderful the, the presidents all lowered tax rates and we had a fantastic free market 1920s? Uh, I was just interviewed on this very subject. In fact, I think it might even be airing today on a TV show on Fox News, which uh, you shouldn't all hate Fox News. Uh, they, they have one good person there, <laughs> a Judge Napolitano. But, but anyway, they had me on to talk about the Depression 1920, and the other people they were going to have were all basically saying the 1920s were fantastic because of the free market policies. And I said, I think it's important for us to insert a major caveat here, which is the Federal Reserve's policy, the inflationary policy. Because if we say the free market was at work in the 1920s, then where did 1929 come from? That, that, that becomes the question. So, and also, Calvin Coolidge, the president in the second part of the 20s, was not very concerned about what the Fed was doing. I mean, explicitly. This was one area where Herbert Hoover was good. Herbert Hoover was worried about the 20s inflation. And Coolidge thought, oh, this is typical bonehead Herbert Hoover. Who cares about him? Don't worry about it. Um, it seems to me like the major spikes come in 1924 and then from 1927 through 1928. So, but I don't think it's possible to quantify, to say this portion of the prosperity was phony, this was real. I don't think we ever can say that, but we can say qualitatively that the economy was not fully healthy because its resources were being at least partially misdirected. I mean, the boom that the U.S. just endured was not all phony. Like, it's not, but we can never exactly say which activities are what we might call false activities. We can begin to understand that. In, in the bust phase, as we see things liquidated, we can get a rough estimate. But even then, there is not an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between a, a, you know, a, a project that shouldn't have been started and a project that's liquidated. It's not quite so simple. So I'm not sure there really is a very easy answer, a, a, a quantifiable answer, other than simply to say that some portion of it was unsound because of the Fed. I don't think we can go further than that. Okay. Bom, acredito que tem tempo para mais uma pergunta, eu vou tentar juntar duas em uma aqui. É, o fato da economia, na época da crise é, analisada, ser mais simples em relação, por exemplo, a mercado financeiro, Wall Street, coisas do tipo, muda alguma coisa na análise em si ou não? E juntando, então, no fato da crise atual ter um credit crunch dessa magnitude, com essa complexidade é, na economia, como rebater, então, o argumento, por exemplo, de Chicago, de que primeiro é importante apagar o incêndio para depois é, tratar dos problemas estruturais, não deixar que o pânico primeiro se alastre? All right. Well, this is like a whole seminar question. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the thing we have to put it out. Oh, yeah, and does the change? I don't think it. I think it. I don't think it changes. I don't think it changes the basic contours of the analysis. The, the basic contours of the analysis are that fiscal stimulus is not. And there's more that could be said about fiscal stimulus. Much, much more than I said just here today. Um, but um, 
that that's, that can't possibly help. It can't possibly be relevant. It can't possibly be anything other than impoverishing. And then secondly, with monetary expansion, if the basic contours of Austrian business cycle theory are correct, then it can't ever be, be good to uh, again, further distort, uh, you're further distorting the market. And my, my view would be putting out the fire, I mean, frankly, the, what the market is trying, the market is trying to put out the fire. That, that uh, Greenspan is pouring, uh, Greenspan and Bernanke are pouring gasoline on the fire. So I, I, I and, and secondly, I would want to know how do we prevent future fires? When we put this one out with, not with water, but with giant quantities of cash, if that's how we put out fires, uh, I think we're going to have a lot of arsonists on our hands in the future. So I, I think it's far better to, to, to just, and, and it's interesting, by the way, that AIG, the C, one of the former CEOs of, of AIG said some months ago, you know, on reflection, it would have been better to let AIG go bankrupt. Even he said this, like he would know, wouldn't he? But yet people who said this at the time were crazy, you know, we're going to revert to caveman status, like everyone's going to be crawling around, you know, pulling their women by the hair with clubs. And I was about to say that wouldn't be all bad, but that would just be a terrible joke. This is a terrible joke. No, but but um, and I, I'm convinced that a lot of the, the argument for so-called systemic risk is overblown, that it's an argument that politicians like to use uh, to scare people into doing basically whatever, whatever they want. The fact is that when you have a crisis like this, there's still the same amount of physical stuff in the world. That hasn't changed. It just needs to be repriced. And there are losses that will be suffered. Law, you can't make losses go away. The Fed can write a check. That does not make losses go away. The losses are there. The question is on who, who should bear these losses? The general public or the people responsible for the losses? And it seems to me that this would go much further than any regulatory scheme you can dream up to solving our problem. And then, again, we have to bear in mind that the very central bank that Chicago would point to as a, a, an I instrument for correcting the crisis itself encourages crises like these, not only because of its contribution to the business cycle, but because of the standing invitation to moral hazard that it represents. That everybody knows that there's no physical constraint on the central bank when it comes to bailouts, they can just print up the money, type it in on a computer, so people behave more recklessly. In, in 2008, the International Monetary Fund even said in a report that large financial institutions around the world seem to be relying excessively on the expectation that their central banks will come to their assistance. Hmm. So this is the problem. To st when you have a problem like this that invites this type of situation, artificially cheap credit and bailout expectations that are semi-consistently fulfilled, you, you will have a system that, regardless of all the attempts to micro-regulate, is always going to lead you into grief. Instead of these micro-regulations, instead of trying to apply s scotch tape to a house of cards, we should get rid of the house of cards and build a house of brick, I think is the Austrian answer. Okay? Thank you very much.